So at the highest level of consultancy and performance and coaching, mm -hmm. we actually get people to do more of what they love, which is probably a hobby and not actually happening in their workplace. Does that make sense, Joe? It really does. And in addition to that, I feel like when people are doing the jobs that they're most passionate about, it relates in less burnout. Like as an example, I love teaching process. I love developing process. I love being in a place of process. So I could do that 60 hours, 70, 80 hours a week and still feel fulfilled. But if you are now saying, give me half that time instead of 80 hours a week, give me 40 hours a week in data entry. Suddenly it's exhausting. And after 20 hours, I don't have any gas left in the tank. Hello, 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 and welcome back to another fantastic Wednesday and another episode, episode 205 of Electricpreneur Secrets, the Electrician's Podcast, where me, your host, Clay Newmeyer, and my esteemed co-host, Joseph the Salesbot Lucani, jump on here with you to get behind the wheel of the van, behind the windshield to help you master your sales, simplify your pricing, and deliver premium level electrical service. Today, Joe, we've got a continuation of everything we opened up a can of worms on yesterday. And what I'm going to pose this as the title of this episode, Upside of Overwhelm. Ooh, I like that. A little pie in the sky, right? We mm -hmm. started the week off with with really the upside of low call volume too. So we're really good at turning things around and building the mindset off it, man. Silver lining for the win. Silver lining for the win. Speaking of silver linings and, and living on the lighter side of things, mm -hmm. I've actually got a joke for you. Really? All yes. right. Yes. <laughs> Dare I say, let's introduce an electrical joke segment. What do you say? Go for it. Sure. What's up? What you got for me? Okay. What's the difference between God and an electrician? Sounds like heresy, but uh, let's see. What is the difference between God and electrician in a fictional sense? I don't know. What? God doesn't think he's an electrician. Ah, uh, I got you there. there. Okay, okay. Man, we dove into this topic yesterday, and I want to just get right started with that. By the way, if you like the joke, please say, please say, I'll keep them coming. I got one for every day. If there's anything we want to do, it's also explore the lighter side of life, have a little bit of fun while we're at it. Um, the upside of overwhelm. We were talking about the excitement that we mm -hmm. even have in our program, in this podcast, in the growth and development of getting greater strategies to you, our listeners, our engagers in the Facebook group live with us now and or otherwise listen to the replay wherever you heard it first. Mm -hmm. The upside of overwhelm is as simple as this. Overwhelm is kind of a place where you're in the valley, right? You're in the valley of despair. You're kind of stuck in this rut and you're feeling everything. And you had some really good ways of describing this yesterday, if you wouldn't mind yeah. hashing through it again. Sure. So for me, overwhelm felt more like putting blinders on, right? Now, a lot of times people say like, I'm clear thinking in this moment. So to visual perspective would be imagine you're standing in a field and you're clear thinking, meaning you could see from one end to the other, no fog, no darkness, bright blue skies. As anxiety, depression, and overwhelm kick in, it's not that you change your location and it's not that you change the physical space around you. It's simply that it becomes fogged. And the, when overwhelm happens, it's you pretty much taking a basket and putting it over your head. And you now assume that the world exists within this basket. You're still just as opportunity seeking as you were previously, but your lens and your viewpoint is so far diminished. And you'll often make decisions that when you look back at it, you're like, yeah, that wasn't smart. And I have one very good example of this in a real life scenario that happened in my business. You mind if I sure. touch on it? Yeah, let's hit it. Okay. Previously, I remember there was one point where, you know, we were running everything out of an ice cream shop, right? We had a parking spot, an ice cream shop, but we came to a point where like, we need to have a, we need a physical location. And we took the bite and we bought this big location. We had a rented space and had like a warehouse attached to it and had a training room facility, had, like everything. And immediately after we did it, we poured tons of money into the building. 
And I don't remember exactly what happened, but I remember there was a time where like sales just went down, our expenses were way up. And we said, I don't know what we're going to do. I know in overwhelm, we said, we're going to sublet out our training room. We're going to block that room off. We'll sublet it out. No problem. We didn't need all this space anyway. But naturally, sales went up. I tweaked the process. We became this consistent again, and the money poured in, except now we were 900 square foot less. And the problem with that was the entire time we were thinking about it, it was, man, I wish we didn't sublet that space out. I wish we could have had it. Now we need another facility that we need to invest in. Now we need to go even further in order to have another room. We could have had that space in place, but we didn't because we felt overwhelmed and trapped. And again, just to explore that then, like why sublet it out? Like root cause here. Root cause was scarcity. It was a scarcity mindset. It was like, imagine your expenses are here and then you buy a shop which requires thousands per month in rent. Or then you're like, I'm going to pour twenty, thirty thousand dollars in savings into the development of this. And then we're going to take less jobs so that we can build the location. And then we're going to do less things. So we dedicated so much time, so much resource, so much money into it right around when we were unexpectedly hit with a slow season. And because my mindset was built into development, I wasn't as sharp on my sales process. Good salespeople to have one individual soul focus. And they develop that to be like a spearhead. And the more you make them do other non-sales related tasks, you're dulling the edge. And that's what I was doing. I was dulling my own edge, focusing on other things. The moment that I was able to step out of that operational development and focus on sales, it came back in and we didn't need the money anymore. But we had already committed to subletting it out and therefore we, our hands were tied. Huge important thing. So what mm -hmm. this might look like for electricians listening to this right now, electricpreneurs rather, is, hey, I've got to run all these sales calls. Hey, I've got all these calls coming in that I'm still answering the phone. Hey, I've now got sales calls and I've got to oversee or do installations. Oh my gosh, I've got so many installations and so many calls coming in. I've got no more room on the calendar. Now we're booked a month out, six, eight weeks out, two mm -hmm. months out, right? Mm -hmm. This actually happens. Now, what do we do? Everything is in a reactive state. And as I mentioned yesterday, one of our listeners and good friends literally had this happening to him. And even those signs of growth were, were showing in his business, he ended up taking a job for three weeks for just the, the cool and calm, like just a place to show up eight to five, put my time in and shut my brain off when it's done. Because mm -hmm. he was desperate for that switch so badly and couldn't find it in his own business. Mm -hmm. What a tragedy. It really is. And, and the thing that throws me is that there was one clear lever that could have been implemented. And a lot of people don't realize that when you're in that place, it's not a curse. It's actually a blessing, but only because you now have time on your side. It's not that we want to be booked out two months. Personally, I think we shouldn't be booked out more than two weeks. Mm -hmm. But with that time, you can now develop your club membership offer. And in that, we really have our strength defined. Right. So it causes some focus. Um, the other upside of this is, guess what? Most people, like, he here's the, the irony of this situation that I find. We're kind of trapped in the prison we don't know we're in. Mm-hmm. Most people were stuck in this box that we've just allowed our RAS, a reticular activating system, meaning what we've programmed in our life, all of the inputs to this point are now dictating the outputs that we have. And mm -hmm. the output is now stuck in that box. It's literally limited with nowhere to go. I can't get more than 24 hours, so I start stealing time from my family. I start stealing time from my health. And how long before that's just a complete of fire, right? Like smoking out the ears. Oh my God, I, I want to quit my own business. Mm -hmm. That's really the problem here. However, we're actually in control of that, right? And, and this is what we're talking about. We're exercising this currently as we realize our own limitations. How do we add value and make better use of our time? And what your schedule is telling you, what that's telling you is actually to build your team up. There's only three things we can do with a task, remember, right? With the mm -hmm. law of open cycles that we mentioned this week, we've got to be able to either A, get it done, 
this is something, a task on my list that I myself am going to do. B, I'm going to delegate it. This is something, albeit maybe a pain in the ass, I'm going to train it to someone and build a process around it for someone to take off of my plate mm -hmm. so that I can just check in on that list, on that SOP and know that it's getting taken care of. And by the way, let's take a hard pause here and think back to our first higher secrets and all the chats we had around that. It's going to suck at first. Can we just be realistic and say, hey, when we train new people, they're not going to be as good as, as us. But that's the point because you overwhelmed aren't as good as you think you are anyway. No one is. And it's only a matter of time before we start dropping this ball. So get it into someone else's ball, their, their field, their court, so that they can elevate it to a level that you never could. Or number three, getting back to the law of open cycles, is we're going to eat crow. In other words, we're recognizing that this doesn't need to be done. Why are we doing it? It's just other people like displacing their shit onto our schedule or we're over committing ourselves or having cross commitments across our team. All mm -hmm. of those are absolute evil for your sanity. Am I making sense, Joe? Yeah, I can pick up what you're putting down. And it's not enough to just say that it's a lack of sanity at times. It's a lack of focused sanity and intentional sanity. Like you can have all the right pieces in place, but when you're in a place of overwhelm, it doesn't feel like it's there. It feels like you're missing something. And because you feel like you're missing something, you're often grasping at things that don't need to be grasped at. Mm. I want to share a secret. Why? It's electric printer secrets. That's what we do. We give them mm -hmm. away. I want to give you guys the keys to this little cell that you might be feeling you're in right now. It's actually quite simple how to break out of this. And what it requires is a moment of clarity. See, most people don't actually know. They're not focused on what they personally want. I think we've touched on this a couple of times on this podcast. Mm -hmm. It can be extremely difficult to get to the core root of what brings life to some people and what they need in their life to feel that positive energy, feel more vitality for their work and their workplace and the work they do and the passion of serving at the highest level. Mm -hmm. The solution to overwhelm is not do more, knock more off the list necessarily if there's not enough time to do it all. If you've already gone through the three of the law of cycles and determined, okay, I'm going to eat crow. I'm going to cross this off the list. This one I'm going to do. This one I'm going to delegate. The next thing you can do is actually take some time away from work. Leave the list. The more people try to steal more time to put to the list, but that's actually defeating you. So at the highest level of consultancy and performance and coaching, mm -hmm. We actually get people to do more of what they love, which is probably a hobby and not actually happening in their workplace. Does that make sense, Joe? It really does. And in addition to that, I feel like when people are doing the jobs that they're most passionate about, it relates in less burnout. Like as an example, I love teaching process. I love developing process. I love being in a place of process. So I could do that 60 hours, 70, 80 hours a week and still feel fulfilled. But if you are now saying, give me half that time, instead of 80 hours a week, give me 40 hours a week in data entry. Suddenly it's exhausting. And after 20 hours, I don't have any gas left in the tank. So another thing that focus on when it comes to burnout is, are your teams doing the things that they're most inclined to do? 100%. And, and since you mentioned like data entry, uh, a data entry sucks. Yeah. But like one person on our team, Mr. T in the background, Mr. Data Analyst and Manipulator, the guy responsible for the KPI charts and all of our sales dashboards and everything we have in our business, absolutely incredible strength. And he loves it. Mm -hmm. So just knowing too, that just because you don't like to do a task doesn't mean there isn't someone who loves it that you can delegate that to. And that's the whole entire point. Exactly. If, if you ask a guy like, um, maybe the best person I could, I could use as a reference is like Dr. Oz. 
You okay. know, here are this guy on TV. He's got a TV yeah. show. He's an acting heart surgeon. He's written multiple books. He's a father of a few children, devout Christian. Like the, the list goes on. The guy squeezes so much in the week and people have to ask, how do you do all that and be the main host of your own TV show? Where's the time for it all? And the answer is he only does about a half dozen things in each of those. He's sorted out to find the most impactful things that he needs to do that no one else can do. And that's all he does. And he builds a team around everything else. Example, heart surgery. Does he need to open up someone's chest himself? No. No. General surgeon medical school, I'm sure, teaches that. I couldn't vouch and say for sure, for sure. I haven't done that schooling, but I'm pretty sure you could build a team around people that open and clean up afterwards and stitch up, close up. So what he needs to do is come in for those dedicated moments where it's like, everything's prepared for you, Dr. Oz. Please come in, do your magic work with your magic hands. That might take him half an hour, hour, hour and a half. I don't know, but that's all he does. Then he cleans up and goes and does a TV show. And guess what? He doesn't have to run the camera. He doesn't have to run the sound. He doesn't have to do editing or production or the network and the team handle all of that. All he's got to do is go out on the set and read the teleprompter and go off script when he feels like it. It's your show, mm -hmm. right? So you kind of get the idea. Even as a parent, you could really chart this out. What are the most impactful things I do as a parent? Maybe you decide, well, that's having dinner with my family. So guess what? My phone does not belong at the dinner table because this is devout family time. I need to give them my 110% right now. Maybe it's I need to help my kids with the homework, depending what age they are. And maybe it's I need to put them to bed at night. And in the mornings, I need to see them off before school if that's an option for you. And then any sports or plays or dance recitals or doctor appointments, right? You come up with six things pretty quick that just become non-negotiables for that part of your life. That making sense, Joe? I'm loving what you're saying here, man, because I'm thinking about Dr. Oz and obviously you see the face on the tabloids and all that, but knowing that there's so much more behind the scenes really inspires me to say, well, what more can we do? Like if there is something where I could sit in an office all day and do process work for 60 hours, but maybe we could tweak it ever so slightly and now we could be even more impactful with less energy. Like the thought is, it's an insane concept, but it really does have strong bones. You know what, man? In this business, albeit maybe a little bit chachi, are you familiar with the term chachi? Yes, I'm familiar with the yeah. term chachi. I was going to say, I think almost every Italian knows that term because their grandmother has chachkis on the wall. There you go. There you go. Albeit per perhaps a bit chachi, like, like my queen bee role here and with you on this podcast is to influence Mm -hmm. It's to influence electricians to seek a higher level of service because they can and because they, the other they, your clients, homeowners, who we happen to also be and have family and friends who are, need that level of service or at least the mm -hmm. choice to have it because currently, at least when we started this, it didn't seem present. And even at the highest level of other sales organizations, I don't throw sand very often there's just some salesy shit going on. Mm -hmm. And we don't fucking do that here. We actually present value, heart on the sleeve. I'm here to serve you at the highest level. How would you like to proceed? It's your choice and every choice is a great choice so long as you choose us to help you with this project, this task, this job, this service. And I feel great about that. So our chachi first thing to do is really to influence electricians. But after that, for me, it's, well, to find new ways to market and influence electricians. And then it's, ironically, to find the best way to communicate value through a process that people call a sales process, which you would uh, relate with sales pressure. But it's actually, again, hard on the sleeve. Here's how we help people. Do you think this would help you too? in the yeah. best, most conducive possible way to get people in and winning as fast as possible. That's like my half list of, of you know, what's like my queen bee, my top three things that I need to do. That breaks out into about a dozen things, but really it comes down to a few things. So anything outside of that is actually a distraction. 
you know, I love that you're saying that because it brings back to something we started with. Remember how I mentioned a salesperson is a spear point? I feel like any position in your organization becomes more effective when they're targeted, effective, and focused. Because right now, Clay, I'm going to say this publicly. I think you're an absolutely brilliant individual. Like you have my respect. You've got my love. You've got my loyalty. I'm very, very proud to be your partner. And I think one of the things that really defines you and sets you out is how determined you are to succeed at overcoming any obstacle. Now, if we took that focus and we aimed it towards something else, you're still going to succeed because you're you. But at the same time, I think that we would succeed as a whole less with you doing too many things. And how many of you business owners are in the background in the same thing? Where you're equally as skilled as Clay and I, but the difference is, is that we're focused with our mission, whereas you are not. What could change if you were able to just have a little more focus and intention in what you do every day? It's incredibly powerful and I appreciate those words. I mean, one of the exciting things is we get to come here and be so transparent one of the things our clients enjoy about us is we're literally building a business that started January 1st together. Service Loop Electrical took new form with you when you joined this mission, Joe, and they get to watch us use these very same things that we teach to build our business, serve at the highest level. And when you see the inside culture that exists within our group chats, within our clients, within our team, rather, I mean, the client doesn't feel like the right word for them, does it? No, it's not. It's, I mean, the word partners come up, but really it's, we're friends. We're trusted partners and allies. You know, when we work with people, yeah, we can be friends, but we'll push them harder than a friend ever would. We're allies, but we're so emotionally invested in what they do that it comes back to wanting to be a friend again. We're something unique and I love it. I love the uniqueness that we are. And in that first year to go to about 40 clients with almost $4 million in reported wins so far, it's an incredible, credible honor. At the same time, it's so nice to be able to demonstrate this as we go and share these wins, challenges, victories, overcoming. And to speak to what you said about me and, and my kind of relentless approach to overcoming these obstacles and these challenges and finding our next direction, I put it this way, there's something I learned from my coach that I actually did a post on this week called the doom loop. And it's as simple as this. We all, every single person needs growth. And so at the very least, what I can say we all do is we all set a goal at some point for something. In fact, most of us set goals all the time. The problem is that very few of us actually realize these goals because we don't have a strong methodology, a strong strategy to take us through the entire journey to realize it, or at least to a decision point that's based from a place of accountability and metrics, not blame, excuses, and denial. So to boil that down, the doom loop is really this. I set my sights on something. I take my first steps towards it. I notice a negative impact, a conflict, something that requires my resilience and I'm beat down by it and I quit. I create blame, excuses, denial, and then I ride the bottom for a little bit again. Then I set another goal. This happens with smokers. It happens with drinkers. It happens with people that don't want to watch Netflix every night. It happens with you're know, not reading your book. It, it happens in so many capacities, not going to the gym, not doing your exercise, not eating right in your business. We set the next goal. We do it again. We set the next goal. We do it again. And what we see is little mini launch, fall down, little mini launch, fall down, little mini launch, fall down. And some people are following that doom loop for years, Joe, years and years, mm -hmm. maybe decades of your life. Instead of recognizing that that first challenge is actually the first place that we have to decide to push on. And even though it's hard, that's the point at which we're really going to launch, even though it might look like a jagged up and down at first. Is that making any sense, brother? You know, the thing that, that stuck out the most there was I was visualizing it and trying to apply my life to that situation being like, yeah. where, where have I been there? And I mean, I don't mean to change the conversation, but like I'm thinking about it and being like, well, how 
how does someone get out? And personally for me, I found that riding that bottom was the best launch pad ever because you, unless you're going to be throwing a shovel and say, dig through rock bottom, a ball has to hit the ground before it can bounce. I hit the ground hard, Mm -hmm. but I'm bouncing really fucking high. I love that, man. The medicine at the bottom is the mirror. Mm -hmm. As soon as you shift from blame, excuses, denial to I'm taking accountability for this, what am I doing that is a pattern that is a doom loop? What am I doing or not doing that could get me out of this? And the moment you change you, everything starts to change for you. Mm -hmm. That's the secret, brother. And that's the upside of overwhelm is you're going to pull out this mirror. You're going to stop everything you're doing. You're going to seek your moment of clarity, which could take a couple of days, by the way. Sometimes it might be two to four days for someone to really find it. But it even happened to me in a place of overwhelm Sunday night when I wrote three pages of notes at 9.30 p.m., full brain dump that I've continued for a couple of days now. And these are the moments that completely shift your trajectory and get you back to landing in a place that you aimed for. You heard it here first from the pleasant peasant. What action items can we give, Joe? We got to wrap this one up. So let's start with really, it really depends on where you want to start. If you want to take basic, I take it all star. Do you have a preference? Sure. I'll, I'll hit the basic then. Okay, sure. I can it's go so with important to recognize if you're in the doom loop or overwhelm. Uh, I'm going to give you both of these as kind of a side by side. I want okay. you to recognize, am I in a pattern that is repeating itself? Do I keep finding myself short of my goals or finding myself short of a result even towards my goals? Am I blame, excuse, denying what's happening? Is there a mirror to pull out? You hear us talk about the mirror often. So that's so, 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 so important. And then I want you to also think about the law of open cycles and think, if my calendar is full, what am I having to do? What are my main tasks? What do I need to delegate? And what do I need to cut? And you can go through your calendar in any app and just color those events, color what it is, and make sure to label those and sort it out and start setting some time aside for this moment of clarity that you clearly need. That was huge for a base, man. Maybe it was I, I was going to say, I was like, you're setting the standard, but I think I got something that can run, I can, that can run with All that. Right. Add to it. All Let's right. go. So for me, I'm trying to figure out what can I do to my experience to communicate what this doom loop feels like, not just what it is. Hmm. So I want to give an expression and almost like a, a visual story that I think would convey the, the action, if that's okay. All right. All right. So you taught me something which is known as halt. And I use that in so many different aspects of my life. Halt is you're most likely to relapse into something when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, right? Yep. Now, depending on whatever it is that you're facing, you need to overcome. I knew that I needed to stop things when I was in those spaces. Drinking was one of those examples. So what I want you to do when you're in this place is to first recognize before I pour this glass, before I make this action, before I do anything, can I check the mindset I'm in when I'm in it? When you can reflect on your own mindset, you'll find that the action following it has more clarity and gravity. But when you blindly follow the action based on the emotion attached to it, that emotion can be skewed by you being overwhelmed. So the action, the all-star action is simply a monitoring exercise. Before you take any step that you feel you're doing impulsively, ask yourself, am I hungry? Am I angry? Am I lonely? Or am I tired? And more times than not, and I've found this myself, it's usually one of those four. And when you look at that, you're like, okay, I know I'm doing the wrong thing. I need to focus on something else. Big man. That that's huge. Great share. Joe, we got to wrap this up. This has been episode 205 of Electricpreneur Secrets, the Electricians Podcast, brought to you, of course, by our business, Service Loop Electrical, for electricians, by electricians. And we're here five days a week to help you master sales, simplify pricing, and deliver premium level service, even when overwhelm's getting in the way. 
even when low call volume is getting in your way, even when you think you can't get over the email it over objection, we're here for you as we have been this week. So keep joining us. In fact, we got some big, big stuff coming to you for the rest of the week. So we'll see you again tomorrow. Y'all be well.